Um, let me begin by saying I had a bit of a chuckle uh, to myself this week um, when I uh, heard about uh, Prince William and um, the photographers that had followed him around in these early weeks of, uh, of being a dad. And uh, apparently they got some good shots of him getting the car seat into the back of the car. Um, and I chuckled to myself because uh, I remembered what that was like. Um, and I heard uh, that he had practiced it loads and loads of times, as you would, because he knew that the photographers would be uh, after him, uh, you know, uh, taking the photos. And uh, if you get it wrong and you're Prince William, well, it doesn't look very good, does it? So I, I kind of chuckled to myself when I, uh, when I, when I thought about that, um, that particular challenge for him. Um, but then, um, th th then I thought to myself, there's something else that you really need to practice, uh, Prince William, um, uh, your Royal Highness. And that is those uh, buggies. Those, uh, you know, the, not, not the prams, but the buggies that you buy to get kids around in. Um, uh, do you know what I mean? They, they, they are so difficult to fold down uh, and do it right, aren't they? Um, some of you are nodding, you know, you know what I mean. Um, I, and the cheaper they are, the worse it is, isn't it? I mean, you know, if they're cheap, they're really, really hopeless. I remember it now, you used to have to, um, there was like a catch. You had to lift the catch just at the top here. And then there was a bit of foot action, so you had to move your foot up slightly over here. All at the same time, you had to actually push it in too. So you had to do the three things together. Uh, and then it would fold down, of course, or so, or so they said. Uh, but more often than not, I was doing this sort of thing. I was doing the sort of the dad uh, shake, trying to get the thing, do you know what I mean? Trying to get the thing down. Um, you, you, you fathers, come on. You, you, know where I'm, you know what I'm saying here, don't you? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, there we go. Yeah, Matt's pointed to his now. Yeah, but that looks like a, a that looks like a nice, expensive one, Matty. I reckon I could probably do that with one little finger. <laughs> I was normally doing that that sort of uh, awkward shake. Um, I, I had the same sort of trouble these days with ordnance survey maps. They never sort of fold back the way you want them to go, do they? It's easy to get them out, but then you've got to try and put them try and put them back. Um, and I was thinking about that because you know. Some of Jesus' parables are a little bit like that. You, if I can put it like this, you've got to know where to fold them if they're going to make sense. You've got to know where to fold them if you're not going to go barking off up the, up the wrong tree. And so what I want to do this morning with this story is, is, is try to do that, to unfold the story in the right places if I can, and do that carefully. Um, and, and so I haven't actually got three headings like I might normally do, and I haven't used the PowerPoint today either in order to do that. What we're simply going to do is unfold the story, and I'm going to take a step back and say, well, what does this mean for me? How does this really apply to me? We're going to do it like that. Um, but before we start, I need to ask you a question which I think you'll be able to answer. Who's the landowner in the story, do you think? Who do you think the landowner in the story is? Linda, God, the Lord, super, thank you. So that's, that's, that we can get, get out of the way, we, we can be clear about that, okay? If you've got the story in front of you. Okay, the landowner, uh, as Linda said, is God. So the first bit, what's the parable about? Well, we've got to fold it out. <clears throat> well, we have the story, first of all, from Jesus. It's about work today, pay today, workers. Okay, so we need to be clear about that today. You work on a day and you get paid on the same day. Um, that's verses 1 and 2. And some of them get recruited early in the day. And they agree to work for a denarius. Which was a good, a good day's wage. It's a way to think about it. Okay? And then the master goes out again. Verse 3. About the third hour he went out. Now some of you young people, you've got a sheet in front of you. You can help us with this, can't you? What was the third hour? What did that mean? Just so we can be clear what is about 9 a.m. Brilliant, 9 a.m. Uh, because the working day or the time is calculated from 6 o'clock when the day began. So the third hour was 9 o'clock. So the worker goes out at 9 o'clock. Um, and, uh, and this time, if you notice, the terms are different. Verse 4, you also go and work in my vineyard, the owner says, and I will pay you whatever is right. Did you notice that difference there? Okay, that's going to be important. Uh, and some of them got hired later in the day. So we had the sixth hour. Sixth hour was midday. 
Young, young folk, you can help us out with this on the ninth hour. Yeah. What's it say? <coughs> About three o'clock in the afternoon. Yep. Yeah. And some even at the eleventh hour. The eleventh hour was five o'clock. The working day finished at six. And some of them were hired at five o'clock. Went out and said, you can work there for an hour. And when the wages are dished out at the end of the day, the first ones grumble against the landowner, verses 11 and 12, <clears throat> because they got the same as the people that were hired at five o'clock at the end of the day. So what's Jesus' story about? Um, I wonder if you began to think that question yourself and began to come up with some answers to it. Is it saying, for example, that some people will be saved at the last minute? Like, um, like the thief on the cross. Um, well, well, that's true. That's true. But it doesn't work with verse 16. Look at what, look at what verse 16 says at the end there. So the last will be first and the first will be last. The last will be first is okay with that idea of the story. But what about the first will be last? It can't be that, can't, can it? It's not about that. Okay then, maybe, we say, is the story about everyone being equal? The first worker got a denarius, the last worker got a denarius, the story is about everybody being equal. But that's not actually true. That's the trouble with that, it's not actually true. God doesn't treat everyone the same. Believers go to heaven, and non-believers don't go to heaven. And even beyond death, believers aren't treated the same. I'm sorry if that's a surprise to you. I'm sorry if I've got to break it to you that in the, in the, in the new heavens and the new earth, you cannot be the Apostle Paul. You cannot be Jesus for that matter. You will not be any the less joyful for it, but you cannot. All believers are not treated the same even. And still it doesn't work with verse 16. So verse 16 seems to be the key to unlock the parable. And I want to say to you, it is really important. It stops us barking off at the wrong tree. So what does verse 16 mean? So the last will be first, and the first will be last in the kingdom of heaven. What do you think that means? Well, <clears throat> it's obviously talking about a reversal, isn't it? First, last, last, first. And it sounds unexpected. Because you'd expect the first to be first, wouldn't you? And the last to be last. So it's a kind of, it's something that's unexpected. It's something that's a surprise. It's a reversal that's a su surprise. And this week, when I've had a look at that, I want to say to you that the other place in the Bible when it appears word for word, it's not talking so much about a change of order as about a total rejection of the first. In other words, it means, so, that the, so the last will be first, and the first will be lost, not last. So the last will be first, and the first will be lost. Now, now that idea of, of reversal, and of that being a surprise, of people that look like they're right, look like they're right with God, think they're right with God, but are actually a million miles away, is something that Jesus said an awful lot about. Jesus talked an awful lot about that. I mean, flick back with me to Matthew chapter 7. This book itself, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Look what it says there. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Jesus speaking, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And Jesus even goes on to say, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, we did this, we did that, in your name. And Jesus will say, as he says in verse 23, I never knew you. I never knew you. That surprise, that reversal. Now remember, we're unfolding the story. <clears throat> who are the first who became last in the story? That's a question for you again now. Who were the first who became last in the story? Which workers were the first who became last? Pardon? 
Say it again. The well, what about in the story? Who were the workers that became, who were the first that became last in the story? You know the answer. Go and shout it out, somebody. They're the ones who did a full day's work. The ones that were, were hired first, yeah. The ones that did the f- full day work. The ones that were um, paid a denarius. The ones who grumbled, yeah? And what were they grumbling about? Verse 12. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, and you've made them equal to us who've borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. So they were grumbling about that, weren't they? I was on a zero hours contract once. Have you, have you, have you been hearing about the zero hour contract in the news? I'll ask you to think about that while I go some water a moment. Is anybody on a zero hours contract? I was on a zero hours contract once. Um, uh, and it wasn't very nice, I, I, I have to say. Um, but this is like a, a reversal of a zero hours contract, isn't it? Uh, and a zero hours contract, you only get paid for the hours you work. Um, and here, it seems that the people are getting paid for the hours they didn't work. It's like a reversal, isn't it? I don't know what you call that. You can call it a zero hours contract. A pretty good job, I guess you'd call it, wouldn't you? You know, if we could all get a job like that, it'd be great, wouldn't it? <clears throat> um, and I want to say to you, in the world of work, that is unfair. Yeah? That is unfair, isn't it? When you say, you're not sure, are you? <laughs> Whether to say, yes, it is. Yeah, I want to encourage you, let's not, not, let's not get all pious about this. In the world of work, that is unfair. That is unfair. I grumble. Wouldn't you? I grumble. Maybe, yeah. maybe well, I grumble. I mean, what I want to do now, this morning, is to give you permission to side with the grumblers in that sense. I mean, I grumble. In the world of work, that that isn't fair, is it? In the world of work, that stinks. Listen, God gave you a keen sense of fairness, guys. You know, your sense of fairness is God-given. All right? It's not ungodly to want things to be fair. When I go to the, the, the Harvester restaurant, which is a great, great treat for us, and I order a plate of uh, ribs, um, and Daniel, who's 13, orders a plate of ribs as well, because he's getting to that age where he has the same size meal, and, and, the, and, the, uh, and, and, the, and the waitress brings the two plates out, listen to me, I'm looking closely at those plates, and I'm checking to see whether I've got as many as he's got. <laughs> As many ribs as am, am I? Is it just me? Come on, you're looking at me like, is, it, is that just me? No. We've got a keen sense of fairness. I said, it's God's given. It's a God-given sense of fairness. Okay, in that particular instance, it's been spoiled with all sorts of other things like greed and, um, you know, me wanting instead of him. But still, within all of that horrible mess, there is a sense of fairness. And God has put us in, in us a sense of fairness. Um, the five o'clock workers got the same and in the world of work that stinks I have to say that because I want to say Jesus isn't proposing some revolutionary way in which employers ought to pay their employees that's not what the parable is about some things do stink especially in the world of work and we've got people in our congregation who know what it is to struggle with unfairness at work we have people in our congregation that really struggle at the moment, today, with real, genuine unfairness at work. And yet there's something about this uh, grumbling that's going on here, isn't there? Jesus shows them in the story that there is more to this story than we think by focusing on the generosity of the, the landowner. And it's something that gets lost on us. The landowner is amazingly generous. And when we try and read it in 2013 here, some of the detail gets lost on us. First of all, the owner, the landowner, would never go out and hire workers himself. He'd never do that. It'd be like Richard Branson coming down to the place around the corner here and and saying, I'm going to hire my private secretary from... What's the name of the place around the corner here? I remember. Jet. Jet. It'd be like Richard Branson coming down to Jet. It's just, it wouldn't, it's just not heard of. Landowners didn't do things like that. And look, 
even at the 11th hour, at 5 o'clock, he's hiring the ones that are left without work. You know, these, these, these are the real sort of, these are the real bottom of the barrel guys, the guys that were really not chosen because, well, because they really weren't up to the job. The ones nobody else wants. You know, we might think of them as the rejects. They're like the orange creams in the box of Quality Street, you know, that nobody wants at the end. Or, um, yeah, you can think of examples, the cheese and onion crisps at the bottom of a multi-pack. You know, nobody wants the cheese and onion. Do well, some people do like the cheese and onion. He's only got an hour left of work from these guys, and yet he hires them. Let's be clear about this. He doesn't hire them for his benefit. He doesn't hire them for his benefit. He's giving them work in that way. Fairness is right. We ought to feel a sense of fairness is important. But there's a problem with fairness. Because fairness requires weighing things up. I've done this, so I should get that. That's what fairness does, doesn't it, really? Which is right in many areas of life. That is right in lots of areas of life, except one. One very important area. And what's that? In our relationship with God. In our relationship with God. Now, I've, I've unfolded the story out as best I can. What's the story about? Have you got it yet? Have you seen what the story's about now? It's about grace. It's about grace. Grace is simply the story of how God with nothing to gain, pours out into our laps more than we ever deserve. Not as something that we earn, but out of his sheer generosity. The overflow of his generosity and love and compassion. Listen to me. You, you want work to be fair. I, I want the harvester to be fair. But you don't want God to be fair. Listen to me, you don't want God to be fair. Because if God is only fair, if God only treats you and me as we deserve, well, we're in one heap of trouble. We would be in one heap of trouble. You don't want God to only be fair. What do I mean? What do I mean by that? Well, let me use an illustration. Let me step away from the mic and use an illustration that I'm fond of using. It's something you want to show to me. I want you to imagine this hand here represents you or me. Okay, can you all see me here, by the way? Imagine this hand representing you or me. Now, imagine this book represents a record of my sin. Okay, those, those times when I've turned away from God as my loving creator who knows what's best for me. And that's, that's my sin. Now, imagine the space above my hand represents God's. Now look at my sin in relation to me and God. It's a barrier between me and God. And I have to say to you, that's a very serious thing. It's a, it, it, it means that I'm separated from the God that loves me on account of my sin. And the Bible tells me that I'm separated from all eternity if I don't do something about that. And there's nothing I can do about it. And it's the same for me and it's the same for you. And if we want God to treat us fairly, then what well, we will be lost. Because I don't deserve, I, I deserve God's eternal punishment for that sin which is a barrier between me and Him. Now what happened on the cross? My other hand represents Jesus at the cross. What happened on the cross? On the cross, Jesus took the punishment that I deserve for my sin upon Himself. He faced the punishment that I deserve, so that look now, look at my other hand, so that the, the barrier has been removed. So it's been dealt with. And it means that for any boy or girl, any man or woman, who accepts what Jesus has done for them on the cross, they can know that they have peace with God, they can know that their sins have been forgiven, and that they can know they can look forward to an eternity with Him. They can stare death in the face and say, where are death is your, where is your sting? They can know about their eternal future even before they reach the end of their life. That's a wonderful thing, isn't it?
And we receive that gift of God's forgiveness only by trusting in the God who promises it, promises it to us. And that's why it says in verse 4, Go and work in my vineyard and I'll see you right. That's the promise. I'll see you right, God says to you. And the question to all of us is, do you trust him? Do you trust him when he says that? The last shall be first, he says. And the parable is all about grace. And so it's no wonder, is it, that when, when we come to the end of the parable, just peek forward to what we see in, after, after the end of this parable. What, what, what comes next? What comes next at verse 18? You know, to verse 17 and verse 18. Jesus has just been talking about grace. So what does he say next? We're going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. Jesus says it's all about grace and he says this is how I'm going to do it. This is how I'm going to do it. This is how it's going to happen. So let me close by asking you the parable is clearly about grace here. It says we can't earn our way to heaven. We can't do it like a tit for tat, if you like. So I want to ask you this morning, honestly, is heaven, the kingdom of God, is it something that you're trying to earn? Think of the ways that you might try. To, to, how you might end up being like the first who became lost in the story. It might look like this. You say, I'm quite a good person, really. Better than most people, really. I don't steal. I don't lie much. I don't really swear. I'm loving to my family. You might look around at other people and say, well, I don't do pot. Stuff like that. So I'm pretty good, really. That would be a way in which we are earning our way into the kingdom of God. And Jesus would say to us, the first will become last. The first will become lost. Or, or maybe I wear a cross. Or I can name my church. My church is this church here or that church there. <clears throat> I do the sign of the cross. You know, when it's important. I was christened, we might say. I was baptised. My mum took me to church as a kid. That would be the same thing, wouldn't it? Or we might even say, I'm a busy and active member of my church. And I pray and I read the Bible regularly. And all of those things, Jesus would say, it's the last who are lost. It's the first who are lost. The first who are lost. And why, why are those things no good? Because they don't deal with the problem of sin. They don't deal with that fundamental problem of sin. And as we've seen continuing these last few weeks when we've looked at these parables, Jesus is telling people these parables, these stories, in the last few days of his life before he goes to the cross. If you flicked on a few pages, we'd be there in the, in the last few days of Jesus' life. And this parable itself talks about the 11th hour, doesn't it? And so I want to say to us all, you know, we need to remember this is the 11th hour. For every one of us as we sit and listen to God's word this morning it is the 11th hour and Jesus comes to you today he comes to you now as a matter of fact where you are sat and he says why are you standing there why are you standing there now outside my kingdom he says to you can't I be trusted to see you right that's what he's saying isn't he can't I be trusted to see you right Jesus is no man's debtor. He says, put all those things away. I'm, not, I'm no man's debtor. He comes to you as you are now. It's a wonderful invitation, isn't it? That's grace. It's the most beautiful and wonderful thing in the whole world. And Jesus at the 11th hour is holding it out to you. And if you're a Christian here this morning, well, don't we say amazing grace? Don't we? Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. It's amazing, isn't it, Grace? 
But if you're a Christian here, I want you to look at what gave rise to the parable as well. Just, just glance back at verses 27 to 30 of chapter 19. What does it say in verses 27 to 30 of chapter 19? Jesus, just told, Jesus has just told his followers how hard it would be for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. For a rich person to be saved. And then verse 30. You see that again? But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. But Peter says in verse 27, we've left everything. Jesus just said, it's going to be really hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And Peter says, we've left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? And you can see in what Peter's saying there is that he was expecting things to be a certain way. I've done this. What, what, about, what about this? And when things aren't what we expect them to be, when the Christian life feels tough, shall we say, when it seems unfair even, and maybe that's the case for you this morning, it, it ought to be because the Christian life is like that. It's a reminder for us to gaze on grace. To gaze at the wonder of grace again. Because when things are tough and it feels unfair, in whatever situation in life it might be, maybe it's work, it's something else, Grace means that God loves you. And if he loves you, it'll be alright in the end. You've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Saviour and Lord. Grace means that it'll be okay in the end. If it feels unfair now, if it doesn't seem right, God is in control of that. He knows that. He's Actually, the Bible tells us, he's planning all things for good. Even though we might not be able to see it. That's what grace enables us to be able to do when life seems unfair as a Christian. To be able to hold grace up to it and say, well it may not be what I expected, but God doesn't treat me in that way. He pours his grace out upon me. And I'm going to trust him. I'm going to stand on his promises. On all his good promises, even in the midst of this. Amazing grace. That's the subject this morning, isn't it? So how else could we finish a service like this than to sing Amazing Grace? How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That's what we're going to do together now.